Right, Simon, if I can hand over to you, please, to kick us off. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope I can, you can hear me clearly. I hear dishes going in the background, so if someone might find their um, mute, uh, that'd be great. Now, um, uh, I'm going to give you an analysis of the documents which were released Monday week. So uh, these documents have only been in the public uh, domain for seven, eight days, and they were released after the cabinet thought it would be best that the public would see the terms of the deal that they were being asked to sign off on. Um, I'm not going to address the questions of whether or not it's right or wrong to do a, a deal of this sort where you hand over a, an asset to a, a third party. Uh, really, that's outside of the realm of an assessment of the documents. I'm just going to tell you the things that I have seen in the texts themselves that I think are significant. So to give you a briefing as to where it is that these documents uh, come from and what it is that uh, that they're, they're, they, they have been developed from. This is the result of a series of negotiations following the Mulvey report, which was uh, uh, produced at the end of a, uh, a mediation between all the parties. And the original plan was that uh, St. Vincent Healthcare Group, then owned by the Sisters of Charity, would become the uh, owner of the hospital, which would be paid for by the state. After the, uh, the, the, new, the new lease now says that St. Vincent's Healthcare Group will be the owner of the uh, new hospital, but that it is no longer owned by the Sisters of Charity. It is owned by a new charitable institution uh, called St. Vincent's Holdings Group or Holdings. So um, I'm mostly going to be talking about when I say St. Vincent's, I'm going to say St. Vincent's to mean St. Vincent's Healthcare Group. And that's because it's the company in the series of companies that we're gonna discuss that has the most uh, uh, presence in this set of, uh, of um, operational papers. So uh, the deal is that there will be a lease, that the St. Vincent's Healthcare Group will be the landlord, that the health service executive will be the tenant, and then the health service executive will do a, uh, a deal with a third company, the uh, National Maternity Hospital at Elm Park, which is a new company that will be set up. And that new company will then operate the hospital inside the building, which the state will pay for. So the state is the tenant, the hospital operational company will be uh, the National Maternity Hospital at Elm Park, that's the name of the company. And, and that company will have three directors nominated by St. Vincent's Healthcare Group, three directors nominated by the current Hollis Street Company, and three directors nominated by the minister, nine altogether. Um, so that, that, uh, that agreement means that the lease is the sort of the core as to what can happen between the HSE and the St. Vincent's Healthcare Group, and it controls the property element and the property controls that come from it. The, uh, the operating license controls what may be done uh, operationally between all three of the parties in terms of providing the services. And then finally, the last uh, uh, document that was, uh, that was released is the constitution of that new National Maternity Hospital so that we can find out what can it do. Now, there, I, I've read them all, I'll spare you the details. The key points that I think are, are relevant are the principal objects for the company, what the company may do, the purpose of the license, what, is the, what are the terms of the license, what is the core of the license agreement, and the powers the minister has as a golden shareholder, and we'll talk about that in a minute, in the new National Maternity Hospital. So I'm going to talk about those three things because they're the areas I think of greatest significance in terms of ensuring the operation of the hospital in such a way as it can provide clinical services to women over the next 299 years and infants uh, over the next 299 years in a way that um, does not limit those services and which is also uh, what is expected by all the parties. I should start off by saying as, I, uh, uh, as well, I accept the bona fides of every single party in, in respect of all of these documents. 
and everything I say, you, you should take it as read that everything that is, that is expressed uh, about the, the intent, I'll accept. So there's no argument about that from me here. So the first thing I will tell you is that the um, uh, lease agreement, which is between St. Vincent's Healthcare Group and the health service executive, has a core definition which sets out what is the permitted use of the property. What is, what, are, what is the state allowed to do with it? And that definition is, I don't know if I have the power to share my screen here, do I? If I did, I'll, I'll throw it up so I don't, you don't have to listen to it with your ears. You can see it written um, down. You don't, I'm afraid. Such is um, life, yeah. that's okay, we live. Um, uh, and the host has disabled it, so maybe the host might spot a way of doing it. But anyway, the, the permitted use is, in relation to the National Maternity, Maternity Hospital area as a public hospital, primarily for the provision of all clinically appropriate and legally permissible healthcare services, including research by a maternity, gynecology, obstetrics, and neonatal hospital, and a range of related health services in the community, and any other public healthcare service or services. That's the permitted use. Simon, you might try to share there. I think I've given you um, permission. I feel Sorry. this surge of power. Surely Sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> no, that's okay. Here we go. Now, so this is the permitted use clause of the lease. That permitted use clause says there are two tests for every use that was in intended. The test is that the use must be both clinically appropriate and legally permissible and a healthcare service. So no more cinemas. But so clinically appropriate and legally permissible is the dual test that has been put into this lease. Now, the other thing that we want to look at is because it has been an issue of, um, of controversy or at least disagreement, is who will, own, who will own this building and this land? The HSC is taking a lease here. Well, we go down to the very bottom of this and we look at the first schedule, which defines what is the premises that the landlord, that is to say St. Vincent's Hospital, will own. And that premises is all part of the campus shown on a plan, we didn't get the plan, but that's okay together with any buildings erected or to be erected thereon and all additions alterations or improvement from time to time so the St Vincent's Healthcare Group is going to own the property which they already do and they will also own any buildings built on it now or in the future that's the what the lease says now so that, that's the permitted use I'm going to unshare for a minute to so save you haven't seen me uh, uh, find the next part of the, uh, the, the the puzzle. And then we want to look and see at the, um, what is it that the hospital company, the new National Maternity Hospital Company is going to be permitted to do inside that building. So uh, how do I unshare? Yes, here I go. Uh, that, is a, uh, that is also carefully written to match the definition that's used in the lease. So the hospital, is going to have a, uh, a, a limitation on it such that it cannot operate um, except if it also is performing something which is clinically appropriate and legally permissible. And nothing which is not clinically appropriate or legally permissible is going to be permitted. And for reasons I don't understand, my copy of that constitutional document, which has been here in front of me all, all, all week, has now slid sideways. Nonetheless, uh, what we have is we have a situation where each one of the documents, the option agreement, the lease, the, uh, the, the constitution of the new company and the, um, and the option agreement, the other option agreement, because there are matching option agreements where the state could do things if, uh, if St. Vincent's fails to uh, act properly and St. Vincent's could do things if the state fails to act properly. So all of those uh, are combined to, to agree that nothing may be done at any stage which is not clinically appropriate and legally permissible, both two stage test. This comes into operation really uh, uh, crucially in the circumstance where uh, the uh, minister has a right to exercise a golden share 
So the minister's golden chair is there to ensure that what everybody says they anticipate and which everybody in the clinical world, for example, in the hospital says that they expect to be done, which is that whatever is appropriate, uh, legally permissible, whatever is done now or in the future, which is appropriate to a national maternity hospital, that there will be no bar on delivering anything that's legal. And if you have listened to the minister recently or any of the clinical experts who are uh, saying that this is a good deal, you'll say that you'll see that they say that that everything that is uh, legally possible permissible sh can be offered. But they don't discuss the clinically appropriate test as well. So uh, we are in a situation where the minister's golden shares have very strong, very strong um, uh, controls over the uh, the new hospital's uh, actions. It, they really are very powerful. And those controls, hang on a second, I'm going to throw, throw it up. First of all, uh, I'm going to share again here. Are we seeing the same thing? Yes, I think we are. This is the, uh, the constitution of the new company. And as you can see, here is the principal object. This is the principal object, and it's defined in very familiar terms, the provision of all clinically appropriate and legally permissible healthcare services. So that's the test. And any services here shall be adopted in accordance with the clinical and governance arrangements. But this is the principal object up above, 3.1. Now, I'm going to take you down to the minister's golden share. The golden share is one of the reserved powers. These are, this was part of the special deal which has been done. And the reserve powers are read very well. The minister down here has a, a golden share, which I can see. Yes, the minister shall hold a share referred to as the golden share to provide legal protection on the inviability of the gold reserve powers in the manner provided for in this constitution. And that is an important distinction there, that clause to ensure the obligations of the directors as contained in this constitution are complied with, and to ensure that any maternity, gynecological, obstetrics, and or neonatal services which are lawfully available shall be available in the new NMH. Now, in truth, I would like to see that golden share of, uh, to be fully effective. That seems to me to be a strongly worded clause. Unfortunately, you can't just read one clause. Because as you can see here, the minister has only a clause which, which deals with the lawfully available test. He doesn't have a clause dealing with the clinically appropriate. That's, I don't think the clinically appropriate test is a good idea. And I'll tell you why in a minute. But that is a clause that I would like to see. That's a good clause. But up here, up at the top, you find out that the reserve powers are exclusively subsidiary and ancillary to the principal object. Now that means that they can only operate, all of them, including the minister's golden chair, can only operate if they are in compliance with the, te the tests in the principal object. And you'll recall the tests are clinically appropriate and legally permissible, not just legally permissible. So unfortunately, the minister's golden chair is a little bit far down in the stack in terms of uh, rights, it isn't up here at the principal object. And in an ideal world, the minister would have a golden share in the landlord company, but he does not. So the golden share protections are very strong on their face, but they are always balanced on whether or not they are in line with, because they're subordinate to this clinically appropriate and legally permissible test. Now, it does not matter if all of the parties today agree what they mean what they mean to say when they say it's a clinically appropriate as a test the reason for that is that this is a 299 year agreement and a 299 year agreement should define the clauses within it such that there is no ambiguity otherwise at some point over the next 299 years, there will be a crisis. And we have seen with the history of, for example, uh, the uh, Eighth Amendment in the years when it was within the constitution, that what 
its promoters originally said was a very straightforward meaning with only one possible uh, interpretation. That over time, that interpretation is unpredictable and it is affected by events. That was a period of time of approximately 30 years. This is a lease which will last about 10 times as long. But we do not have anywhere in it, in the lease or in Elm Park's constitution or in the coordination agreement, which is a kind of an agreement to agree, nowhere is there a definition of what clinically appropriate means. Now, I will concede immediately that maybe everybody who was doing the deal recognized what we meant there was X, but it doesn't matter because it's not within the deal. And if we haven't defined it within the deal, the consequences of that are that it is open to an alternative interpretation in the future by persons or persons as yet unknown and potentially unborn. As I was saying uh, to someone recently, a 299 year deal for the provision of healthcare services is an astonishing deal because 299 years ago, one of the Medicis was becoming the Duke of Tuscany. That was pre-French Revolution. And we're projecting that into the future at the current rate of technological advancement and climate change in terms of the, uh, the location of the, the, the hospital, et cetera. So 299 years is the length of time this deal has to last for. And, if, and therefore, it is my opinion that a double test where one of the tests, nobody has any problem with legally permissible, that does speak for itself but where we don't know what is clinically appropriate, that it invites a risk of 299 years of litigation. Every time any new in, uh, uh, procedure comes up, the question will have to be asked, is this a clinically appropriate procedure? Every time a appropriate procedure has to be applied, it'll be, is this a clinically appropriate time to use that procedure? Now, I'm gonna show you some of the uh, terms of the lease what are the consequences of a disagreement about clinical, uh, clinically appropriate? So this is down here. We're gonna to go to or, he said, frantically trying to remember where it came in the alphabet. Rent, rent is set at 850,000 euros per annum or such revised rent as may be payable because there are rent reviews set in the lease every 10 years. So we'll have 29 rent reviews and typically they don't go down in rent reviews. So the rent is 850,000 euros per annum. You'll have heard perhaps that the state is only paying 10 euros per annum. And that's because there is what's known as an abatement, an agreement to pay, to charge less under certain circumstances. So you'll see here, the yearly rent shall be abated to 10 euros per annum, so long as each of the following conditions are complied with. And here are those conditions. And the one that jumps out at me is C. No change to the permitted use without the consent of the landlord. Remember, permitted use means clinically appropriate. Anything new that is clinically inappropriate in the, in the uh, opinion of the landlord will constitute, in their opinion, a change to the, uh, the, uh, per, to the permitted use and the rent goes from 10 euros to 850,000 euros in that event. It is a slightly imbalanced in favor of the landlord's point of view in terms of arguing what is and isn't uh, permitted use. Nonetheless, as I say, it is there and that is the abatement. The abatement is 10 euros, but the 10 euros is subject to the clinically, uh, clinically appropriate test. If something happens, which the landlord feels it is not clinically appropriate, then they can say, we wish to raise up the, the rent to the standard set amount of 850,000 euros per annum. Uh, again, if we did not have a clinically appropriate test in the permitted use clause, we would not run into this problem. Uh, and you'll see that over and over again, all of the protections, which the state are very happy to point out and which I'm happy to accept are were negotiated in the best of intentions, but all of the protections rely on what will the phrase clinically appropriate be just de determined over the next, you know, 300 years worth of courts 
300 years worth of ministers for health, 300 years worth of uh, individuals who, you know, may not yet be born, but may one day sit on the boards of all these companies. So if you leave it ambiguous, you invite problems. If you, if you have a definition that would be better, and if there's no need for it in, in the agreement at all, which I argue there is not, then it would be better still to remove it entirely. However, there, was, there has also been an objection. We can't define it because if we were to define it, we would limit future inventions or new technologies, new services that could be offered because they wouldn't fit inside the definition. Well, there's a very uh, familiar piece of legal drafting that deals with this. You place a list, which is a non-exhaustive list, and you place whatever it is that is concerning people. So you would say, for example, you might say, permitted, uh, uh, as you're defining uh, what is clinically appropriate, you would list a series of potentially controversial topics or, or, or services which people would feel they would be worried, would these go ahead? And you'd explicitly say that, but you would say the phrase, these clinically appropriate, including but not limited to, and then you would put your list. And that means that in the future, if there are new clinically appropriate services, you're not limited to that list. It's there by way of a reassurance. Now, there was news from the minister yesterday. He told us that in fact, the request to put in a test of clinically appropriate came from the HSE. Now, this is actually very good news because it means that the state could also simply easily request to take it out. It's not a requirement from the landlord. It's within the gift of the state to put it in or take it out as, as it needs. Now, from my point of view, I think it is a bad idea to leave it in because it is an ambiguous term. That's my reading of the, the situation. And I think they should remove it. If they don't want to remove it, I think they should define it. If they not, neither want to define it or remove it, I think it's worth asking why not. But that's a, a, an argument for another day and falls outside of a legal analysis. That is a political question, I would say. Now, those are those are the highlights. Is there anywhere there that I said I was going to hit and I didn't hit it? That's a, kind of a depressing highlights, Simon, but thank you. I think you've you've covered a lot of, of questions. Um, is there anything else you wanted to add or? Uh, one other thing. Yeah. I would say that um, the minister has said in answer to the question, why do we not just get a gift of or even buy outright this site? which would remove this complexity of a landlord uh, and tenant relationship and would allow uh, um, the hospital to run on a publicly owned site. And I would say to you that the answer which is given, which is at base, the nuns did not want to do that, is understandable in circumstances where the previous owners of the healthcare group were answerable to the Vatican under canon law for the disposal of, of property and the nature of the disposal of property, including land. And they were bound by those rules and the requirement to get Vatican approval. However, since the new entity has come into being and is the owner of these properties, and it is wholly independent and not explicitly, explicitly not bound by canon law, it seems to me like it would be a worthwhile exercise to repeat the request which was turned down under the previous uh, ownership regime and say, actually, this is a circumstance where we now have new owners. They're not bound by canon law. They don't have the restrictions on the disposal of assets. And therefore, it seems like it's worth asking them the same question as was asked of the previous owners. Would you gift it to us for charitable purposes as a gift? And if not, would you sell it to us? Uh, as far as I can see, that hasn't happened. All of these agreements, for example, are dated, uh, this one is dated 20, uh, 2022, other ones are dated uh, March 2022, prior to the, the changeover of, um, of circumstances. This one, I think, was dated, yep, yeah, March 2022 as well. So these are documents which predate the change of ownership, and all of the negotiations which created these documents were all took place under the previous ownership. This is a new a new situation and I think it is worth seeing whether or not this these questions these sort of core questions could be revisited.
Have I got anything else that I haven't touched upon? No, not that springs to mind. Thanks a million, Simon. Um, I see Peter Boylan has joined the meeting, which is great. And Peter, if you wanted to um, say a few words on this, you're very welcome to speak now. I'm and sorry. I won't make you forever hold your peace if you don't. <laughs> or if you if you could just shout up now if you wish to. Um, and if if not, we can come back to you. Trying to unmute a success. There you are. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Peter. Not at all. I'm, I'm late, late to this party. Uh, you're talking about clinically appropriate or clinically indicated, which are more or less the same thing. And it has a very specific and well-recognized meaning in medical practice. So uh, it's not complicated at all. You do something if it's the right thing to do for the patient. So uh, what it means in terms of um, a woman's autonomy in, in terms of making a decision with particular reference to the 2018 Act following repeal of the 8th, the Termination of Pregnancy Act, where a woman can elect herself um, to make the decision to terminate a pregnancy up to 12 weeks. Uh, it gives, um, it removes her autonomy in making that decision potentially. She might see a doctor uh, who has a conscientious objection, um, who has been appointed because the board have moved in a conservative direction and uh, the doctor will say, well, look, it's not actually clinically appropriate or clinically indicated in your case, and therefore you'll have to go away. Um, and that is the risk associated with the use of the term. Um, I would agree that the, if it's not going to be removed, then a non-exhaustive list should be included uh, with the phrase that Simon uh, mentioned, uh, including but not limited to. And that would allow for, for changes in the future when things like... Um, gene therapy come on board with CRISPR uh, technology, which is coming down the road. There's also in the more general hospitals, of course, there's the issue of the end of life care. So these are things that are not considered. Um, now, the, the definition that has been bandied about um, that it, it, it is to, uh, to retain the hospital building for maternity, gynecological and neonatal services only is a rather bizarre one, uh, not one that I've come across before. And I, I, I don't really recognize it as such, but it raises the specter of um, the maternity hospital side of things not being particularly busy. And it's one of the features of maternity hospitals that there's an ebb and flow of numbers. You can get an incredibly busy time, but you can also get a time when there's not a lot happening. Now, if the maternity hospital side of things has empty rooms, uh, which is entirely um, you know, anticipated, uh, and there are patients on trolleys in St. Vincent's emergency room, and there uh, are patients on trolleys on the wards, and there's a lot of pressure politically to deal with this issue. There are three representatives on the board from St. Vincent's who are concerned about the overcrowding for reasonable, compassionate and, and correct medical reasons, but also perhaps for political reasons. And then you have three political appointees of whoever the Minister for Health happens to be at the time. Now, those six people um, are under pressure to ease the situation in St. Vincent's University Hospital and there is spare room down the corridor in the maternity hospital, which is joined up, joined at the hip, so to speak. And it's logical that they should use those rooms rather than have patients on trolleys over the place, all over the place with the risk of infection and so on. So does that break the covenant that the hospital is only clinically uh, meant to take patients who are clinically appropriate? because we've heard so much about it's not clinically appropriate to be doing looking after patients who are not maternity, gynecological or neonatal newborn babies. So if you have somebody who's quite elderly in their 80s and 90s who comes in with pneumonia or who has an accident and breaks their hip and so on, you can imagine the situations, all, all sorts of different clinical situations. Does that break the covenant? Now, supposing it's a bank holiday weekend when there's no scheduled gynecological surgery and you've got five operating theatres on the same corridor with the St. Vincent's corridor uh, theatres, and it's a major road traffic accident or God forbid, maybe um, an explosion or something. And you get a lot of people coming in uh, by ambulance and uh, 
a lot of them require surgery. Um, are you going to put somebody's life at risk by not using the theater in the maternity hospital down the corridor uh, when somebody's going to die if you don't operate on them? So the question is that really the, the phrase clinically appropriate as, as it is being interpreted um, by those in favor of the current um, iteration of the plan uh, is doesn't make any sense in a practical sense and is liable to end up with the covenants being broken and uh, 850,000 being charged by St. Vincent's to the state. I, have I got that right, Simon? Uh, yes, I was actually going to say about the question of um, sole usage. Um, and I'm going to pop up a little uh, section here on the old screen share box. This is uh, relating to um, a slightly unusual element of this agreement, which I was surprised to find in it myself when I was reading it. Uh, a part of the premises is to be constructed by the tenant, that's the state, for the exclusive use of the landlord, that's St. Vincent's comprising an area of approximately and shown colored on the plan numbered annexed here too. We did not get a plan. Which area is also defined in the operating license as the same SVHD, the St. Vincent's Healthcare Group areas. Now, it is the case that throughout this lease, it, there's a great deal of stress that these buildings or premises, which are to be built by the state, are solely for the use of St. Vincent's Healthcare Group and that they are also uh, always to be accessible by it, that they are to be kept available at any time. And that's, and that's a requirement under the lease. We don't know how much of this, the, uh, the, the uh, National uh, Maternity Hospital site is going to be covered by these requirements. We don't know how much of the building, if it's within the building. Currently, we don't have any clear picture about that. What we do have, and for the first time, in fact, is that we had a suggestion in a paper that was circulated to TDs, a sort of a fact sheet. I might dispute some of the facts, but it was there nonetheless. And one of the uh, one of the facts that was pointed out is that there might be dermatology services provided in these landlord areas. Now, that was the first time that we'd had an, an example of what they might be for. So it seems to me that there is some sort of possibility that the uh, hospital would not solely be used, the hospital site, the premises, as opposed to the hospital uh, operating company, would that the site and premises would not solely be used for maternity purposes. But the permitted uses only cover uses by the, uh, the new hospital, as you can see here, in relation to the National Maternity Hospital area. That's to say different to the St. Vincent's Healthcare Group area. Uh, of the uh, of the premises. So uh, as to that, it's required because we can only possibly ever use this for maternity purposes. Well, one, I'm not sure whether that, as, as Dr. Boylan points out, whether that would actually last under pressure if there is an emergency. But two, more importantly, uh, it appears that there is no particular need to define that in such a way, because we already know up here at uh, in the I beg your pardon, I have scrolled unwisely. We already know in the um, in the permitted use that it already says that it has to be services by a maternity, gynecological, obstetrics and neonatal hospital. That is already separately required in the permitted use clause. We do not need an undefined clinically appropriate clause to copper fasten it. So those are the two things. One, the question of clinically appropriate is needed to make sure that we don't do things other than maternity activities. That's already covered by the list of that it is to be by a maternity, obstetrics, gynecology or neonatal hospital. And two, that um, that the building itself must be kept sacrosanct and only for these purposes, when in fact the building will be used for mixed purposes by St. Vincent's Healthcare Group and by uh, the new maternity hospital. Are there any questions now that might be worth putting to us? I was just going to say there are some questions in the chat, which I might just read out a couple. And if anybody else wants to come in, please um, raise your hand. And I just see Al Alistair McKinstry has a question here in the chat. What is the role of the Mulvey agreement in this? And he quotes, agreed to by the parties there too, and endorsed by the Minister for Health on behalf of the state, which principles are inter alia designed to preserve the autonomy of the National Maternity Hospital 
in clinical and operational matters. So where does the Mulvey Agreement come in? So the Mulvey Agreement was the output of a mediated uh, discussion by Mr Mulvey, and it came up with a proposal. Now, that proposal ran into some political difficulties, I would say, when it became public. And these collections of documents represent a renegotiation of that agreement. But they do specifically say, in fact, if I can find the clause, I think that they're named. Yep, there it is. Uh, they agree the structure and the board in accordance with the terms of the Mulview report, save as otherwise agreed here uh, between the parties. So it's that the Mulvey report applies in such areas as we have not changed it. That is the role of the Mulvey report in this. Thank Any you. Any other queries? Yeah, could I perhaps ask a question, um, Simon? There's reference there on E, 2-1-E, to completion. Uh, what, what does that phrase mean, or what does that word mean, completion? Uh, completion is a... Is, is a in a project management and, a, and, a, and a, uh, in an agreement, there is a point where the building is being built and then eventually there is a sign off and the building is considered to be completed. So in a way, it's a project management term, but it has given, been given a, 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 a definition because we know that because it's uh, that. So completion means the date on which the HSE has completed the development of the new maternity hospital according with the provisions of the sixth schedule. So it meets the requirements of the lease. So at that date, time, that's the completion date. OK, so that's really well into the future. Um, it, it would be likely to be into the future. Up. Yeah, OK. Yeah, just... uh, Sarah Murphy had sent a couple of questions into the chat, which only I can see. Sarah, can I invite you to unmute and maybe you'd like to ask them in person? Yes, sorry, I didn't realise I only sent them to you. Um, so I suppose the first one is we've seen in the US, um, in the US that anti-choice groups take cases to attempt the to stop the provision of termination of pregnancy services. And if it is available in the new hospital, is it possible for an outside entity to take a case against the new NMH or SVHG stating that abortions or anything else they might choose is not clinically appropriate or any other? procedure activity? What I would say to that is that it should be borne in mind that we do have a history of third party groups seeking to um, to take action on behalf of uh, unborn uh, fetuses. So the Society for Protection of the Unborn Child, SPUC, took a series of successful cases and were granted standing in respect of that on the basis that the courts at that time, which are not the courts of today, that that was considered to be an appropriate basis that they would speak for the 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 fetuses of the uh, which were not being heard uh, from in within the court. Those those they took cases on behalf of the unborn child as they were as they were as they termed it, and they and they were given standing. Now I do not believe, maybe I'll be proved wrong very shortly, but I do not believe that a court today necessarily any of the courts that we have today would probably be find that compelling after the changes of the in the constitution and after the implementation of the legislative uh, effect of those changes. However, that is not to say that we can predict what the next 299 years of courts would, uh, would do because social and legal changes come in, over long periods of time to deliver quite surprising changes, quite significant changes over those kind of periods. If we look at the changes in, in Irish society and in Irish courts over the last 50 years, I think we could safely say that it would be an unwise person who would predict that nothing could happen, nothing unforeseen could happen over the next 50 years, let alone 299 years. Um, so then my second question is, again, because clinically appropriate is not defined could SVHG claim, so say, for example, a consultant decides to perform LARCs, uh, a LARC clinic, um, walk in, uh, women come in, say, yes, I want long term contraception. And because it's not medically necessitated, because it's, they are asking for it, could SVHG say, hey, that's not clinically appropriate? And I think it's best to take it in the general so that let's generally say anything in the future might happen. So that is mm -hmm. to say any event might be challenged as being 
that is, is or is not clinically appropriate. And because we do not have a definition of clinically appropriate, but it has been provided for at the very top of every part of this deal, such that it overrides all the other parts of the deal and all the other protections which are excellent within the deal. I will say again, that golden share is very well worded, but it comes subordinate and ancillary to the test of clinical appropriateness within the, uh, within the text of the agreement. But I mean, it is a very strong golden share if it hadn't been made subordinate to this undefined test. Okay. Um, so, I mean, again, the good news is that we've been told the state sought to have this clause put in. It suggests that it's available for the state to seek to have it taken out, therefore, and it's within the power of the state to do that unilaterally. This is very significant because it won't unpick an agreement. It's the case that the state is the one who wanted it there, so they're able to say we'd like to take it out. And if it were taken out, what we realise is that the primary purposes uh, clause, which the minister's golden share is subordinate to, that that only remaining test would be whether or not what was being looked for was legally permissible, mm -hmm. which would not pose a difficulty. So, sorry, one last question, and then I'll turn it over to everybody else. Um, indemnity. So, is there anything in the contracts that you've reviewed that uh, private healthcare is indemnified by the HSC or the state? Um, I was reading recently up on the baby Christopher case, which was a private clinic associated with the National Maternity Hospital, but the reporting stated it was actually the HSC or the state who paid the negligence claim. So it looked like, and maybe Peter would have some knowledge of this, I don't know, that the, the public was paying for a private clinic's mistake associated with the National Maternity Hospital. Well, I'll tell you that falls outside of the papers that were released. And so I'm <laughs> it's it, it was it was uh, it was enough to try and get through this in the course of a couple of days. And I will tell you that I won't try and opine on anything that I haven't read. That's closely. fair enough. I was just wondering if there was anything in the contracts regarding. Not that I have seen, though. I hold my hands up and point out I am not infallible. Yeah. And we might just keep to the kind of the briefing on the actual papers that were released. There was another question from Lorcan in the chat, Simon. The interpretation of the permitted use seems to give the landlord and the hospital a huge amount of discretion to interpret the law. Is this level of legislative derogation compliant with the Constitution? Well, you're not interpreting the law, you're interpreting a lease. And in, as between a landlord and a tenant, it's appropriate that both parties would have the power to interpret that lease. So I don't think that that would run into any difficulty. That's a good issue. And we have Don Look Kelly in the chat asking, will some clinician be placed in the situation of deciding whether to risk their career by costing the comp company 849,990 or deciding to find a way not to provide the requested service? We don't know. And I, I'm not sure whether that's a good enough answer, frankly, yeah. because if we don't know, we should know. We should know. I was just about to say that if the answer is we don't know, we probably should know. And I know there's a couple of questions that have come up. Um, uh, there's another one further down the chat about do we know what the deal with the group and the Vatican who had to approve it? And I know there was a question, a footnote um, by the solicitors in, in on one of the, the legal documents yes. querying the interests of a third party or conditions imposed by a third party. Do you have um, anything to offer on that, Simon? Or uh, I have a small amount to offer. I have a small amount to offer. There is an element of uh, a question which is placed, if I can put my hand on the footnote, it'd be handy as well. And uh, and that question is raised by the um, solicitors for Hollis Street Hospital. And they wanted to know whether or not it would be possible to have, uh, to require a third party to approve the terms of the lease. Now, that third party, I don't know whether they meant the Vatican, which is no longer needed. Remember, this was done while the nuns were still the owner of the property. Or I don't know whether it meant a financial institution, uh, whether or not there's a financial institution that had any kind of uh, property rights that had to be uh, considered. Dr. Boylan put his hands up. And that looks like somebody who knows what they're talking about. <laughs> uh, with regard to the Vatican, we haven't seen, uh, had sight of the papers, the um, papers that went to, to the Vatican from the, from the Sisters of Charity, that is the petition. Uh, we haven't seen sight of correspondence from the Vatican. There's a whole suite of papers 
uh, that are necessary in the execution of the canon law requirements uh, for the alienation process. So we don't know whether or not the alienation process uh, is yet to be completed. So we don't know, for example, that the sisters have in fact uh, completed the transfer according to the requirements of the Vatican. It may well be that uh, it is dependent on uh, the successful uh, incorporation of the NMHDAC and the transfer of ownership of the NMHDAC to SVHG. We don't know that because we haven't had sight of those papers. And we need to see those papers to know what exactly went on between the Vatican and Dublin in its broadest terms, uh, including the sisters and the hospital and the archbishop and so on, the archbishops. So that's a real um, risk. And that may well be what McCann Fitzgerald were referring to about the possibility of third party involvement. I, I, and I see here also, I don't know if I, I, I should, I'm sorry, Mason, Mason Curran rather than McCann yeah, that's Yes, uh, uh, I, uh, uh, I see also that there is a question here from the solicitors for the state, for the HSE, and they're looking to see, it needs to be clarified, what assets and liabilities of the chartered corporation are transferring or being excluded? So this is in relation to the new company, what, what was going to happen? So this is here, this is in Hollis Street. So these are documents which are still, as we have looked at them, parts of them are still under review. But I think really, the core problem here, once we're looking at within the bounds of the agreement, and as I say, leaving aside the ideological question of whether a, the shape of that agreement of, of donating the land and the, the buildings and so on to a third party non-state body, but leaving that aside, within the bounds of the agreement, the core problem that I see here is that like an inverted pyramid, everything balances upon the thin pair of words is it clinically appropriate? And no protections or reassurances anywhere in the, in the document can answer that because clinically appropriate has not been defined. And we can't say what that definition might probably be over the next 300 years in every set of circumstances. So from my point of view, that's two words. If it were to be removed, the minister's golden share, which has no restriction in respect of appropriateness and which, is, which has the power to enforce and direct anything which is legally permissible to be done. Under those circumstances, I think that would be a much better bill to be looking at solely for, if we're looking at it from the point of view of ensuring that the expected services, which everybody has said all parties expect to be provided, that they can continue to be provided without challenge into the future no matter what mix of persons or circumstances occurs. Thanks, Simon. I'm just going to ask a quick question myself, um, because we were talking as well about that issue of um, permitted use. Um, and I did ask the question at a briefing we attended by a panel from Hollis Street um, last week. I, I did ask the question why this, the services that would be permitted could not be listed in a sort of a, a non-exclusive list, I think if that's the correct word. And I was told that that wasn't possible due to the fluid nature of medicine that obviously could change between now and, and, you know, 200 years time. But do you agree with that or do you think that that would, is, is necessary to, to be put in as well as that definition of clinically appropriate as removing the term clinically appropriate? If you remove the term clinically appropriate, you don't need to define what is and isn't clinically appropriate anymore. Yeah. Um, uh, the explanation for not giving a list would only be an explanation if you were providing an exclusive list. In other words, you were trying to list out every possible service and then that was all that could be provided. Of course, that would be terrible because you'd freeze the provision of services as to what was technically available or, or available right now today. But that's not what's suggested. Rather, it's a non-exclusive list. These services shall include but are not limited to. And at that stage, you can add whatever new gene therapy nanobots, Borg implants, whatever is appropriate in the future, then those can be uh, provided as well. If you are intent on keeping the phrase clinically appropriate in the agreement, if you're willing to remove it, you no longer need to define it because the only test is whether or not something is legally permissible. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Simon. Um, I'm just going to touch on another question here on, on something that we haven't mentioned, and I suppose it's down to that values um, 
approach, I suppose, that we're, we're seeing as opposed to a rights approach in the hospital. Um, sorry, my screen has moved and I've missed. Oh, yeah, there it is. And there's a question here, and I'm not sure if this is related to the documents that have been re released or not. But the, the comment from Claire is one of the criteria of the new group, um, I believe this is in the Constitution, is to uphold the vision of Mary Aikenhead. And one of those is to advocate for those who can't speak for themselves. Could this potentially also mean the unborn? Is that sort of that, is this, that Mary Aikenhead values, has that been reflected in the documents that you've read, Simon? Or maybe Peter might want to comment on that. I know I, I got, I'm going to jump in first because I want to clarify. That is on the first page of the new constitution of the landlord, not of the constitution of the new hospital group. But the landlord will own 99% of the shares of the new hospital group with only one golden share, which, as we've seen, is subsidiary. So it's relevant what the landlord's constitution is, I think, because all its company offices are bound to follow the constitution in their role. That's what they're bound by law to follow, the constitution of the, uh, of the, the company. That landlord company, St. Vincent's uh, Healthcare Group, has said that it is engaged in a continuation of the mission of Sister Mary Aikenhead. Now, again, I don't know what effect that has. It could be decorative or it could be significant and it could be decorative today and significant in a, in a challenge that's brought 50 years from now. It's certainty that will ensure that we don't need to worry about these things. And for example, all of the protections of the minister's single golden share would be an excellent answer to the argument, well, look, what about the landlord's ethos? The minister could say, well, I've got a golden share that permits a, uh, uh, the insurer, ensures that anything which is lawfully permitted is, uh, is, it can be provided here. But under those circumstances, we have a situation where the company that the minister has a golden share in, the new National Maternity Hospital at Elm Park, that that has to be provide for whether or not something is clinically appropriate. And Dr. Boylan, of course, can speak better than I can as to the effect of that in medical provisions. But from, uh, from a legal drafting point of view, it seems like a terrible lacunae if you're going to put it into the uh, agreement not to define it. And it seems like it would be a better idea if you can't come up with a good reason why it's there to take it out. Yeah, the uh, Mother Mary Aikenhead values um, are listed and they are unequivocally Catholic in, in intention and origin and definition and so on. It's kind of fanciful to think that the values and vision of Mother Mary Aikenhead and the Sisters of Charity is anything other than Catholic. It's also fanciful to think that those values and vision uh, endorse uh, the provision of services which are directly contrary to Catholic teaching. Now, uh, it's listed in several places. For example, um, when the sisters announced that they were leaving uh, healthcare, they said that the directors of the new company are committed uh, to upholding the values and vision of Mother Mary Aikenhead. Uh, Jimmy Menton, the chair of St. Vincent's at the time, issued a statement in which he said all of the staff on the board uh, are utterly committed to upholding the value and visions of the Sisters of Charity. So it is repeated um, in several places. Now, it's also in the financial statements of St. Vincent's Healthcare Group in 2017 on page 42. It's notes 27, if anybody wants to look it up. And they state there very clearly that the directors of uh, St. Vincent's Holdings are committed to upholding the values and vision of the Mother Mary Aikenhead. So uh, that presents you with an inherent conflict at board level. If the three directors from the four directors, the directors from, from St. Vincent's are uh, committed to upholding the Catholic values and visions, the directors from uh, by the minister may well be um, conservatives. Who knows who the minister for health is going to be in the future? And then you've got six against three NMH now who may also be conservative. So again, there you are in either if the if the Hollow Street the NMH people are not conservative and want to continue to to uh, provide reproductive health care 
uh, well, then they can be outvoted. And then you're into the, the minister's golden share and the minister instructs them, uh, no, actually, I agree because I'm a conservative Catholic. And we've seen this happen all over the world. In the United States in particular, you can see the erosion of women's reproductive health care rights um, by this sort of thing happening. So that is a huge risk to include in the constitution of the companies. And it's a, it's a, it's a fact that the directors need to be questioned on uh, if anybody ever gets the chance to do that. Thanks, Peter. Um, I just had a message in the chat there from Leila from Uplift, and I don't know if everybody has seen it on the call, but there was also an independent um, legal analysis by Stephen Dodd, senior counsel, um, that was done on behalf of Uplift that was published today as well. And I believe that Owen Brady, a solicitor who advised on this, is on the call tonight. Owen, if you were here and wanted to unmute and just just sort of briefly give your input um, onto what we've discussed, you're, you're welcome to, to, say, to speak. Sure, thanks very much. Perfect. Um, look, I'm not going to say much, much more uh, because Simon has done an excellent um, exposition of the, the, the core legal issues um, that are rising as a result of the publication of these documents. Um, back around November, uh, Uplift asked us to um, do some legal analysis on the question of whether it would be possible to um, compulsorily purchase lands uh, for the provision of the National Maternity Hospital. Um, and we brought on Stephen Dodd, senior counsel, um, to do that opinion. Um, so he, he, he produced a quite detailed opinion back, back around November, um, which went into a lot of the case law and so on in, in relation to the, <clears throat> you know, the legal tests that you have to satisfy to um, exercise the power under the constitution for the state to acquire um, compulsory lands uh, for, for the public good, um, such as provision of, of healthcare and so on. And, and pretty conclusively, his opinion found that, um, that there, was, there was no significant legal ob obstacles to the state um, acquiring lands uh, compulsory for the for, for, for a national maternity hospital. So just in the last um, few days after the publication of these documents, we just asked him, would he, would he just provide a quick addendum report, um, uh, uh, you know, just to, to, in, in relation to his high-level high analysis effectively of, of, of the documents. Um, and obviously tight, time is quite tight because of the, the appearances in the doll this, this week and so on. But um, so he's produced um, a short, uh, just kind of um, synopsis of his views on on the legal documents, and effectively, they um, they, they confirm effectively everything that's that that Simon has just said. Really, um, his core um, a, a concern is around as Simon has identified the, um, the definition of permitted use, um, and and of what is clinically yeah. appropriate, um, and that really um, kind of uh, flows through. Okay. everything else um and, and one, of the, one of the issues yeah. that identified as well is but like, the, the, the consequence no, some background noise there there's um, some important shoe putting on going on <laughs> um so so basically the, the consequences are quite severe um uh, uh for the state if there is any breach um, of um, the permitted use. Um, one of the issues that, that, that Stephen had raised back in, in November was whether, um, whether the state would actually own the building upon which the um, National Maternity Hospital, the, the building which the National Maternity Hospital will be, will be, will, will be housed in. Um, because, because traditionally in law, um, you know, you, uh, if you own land, you own the buildings that sit upon the land. And there was a lot of, um, there was discussion, or there was at least a, a number of public comments uh, by, by certain representatives of the state that, the, that, that in fact, that the state would actually own the building uh, on which the NMH would be situated. They might not own the land, but they would own the building. But it's clear from the, the lease and the various documents that have been released that um, the um, St. Vincent's would continue to own the building. And, and that is significant in the sense of the, the potential consequences that could flow from uh, a situation in which that lease was determined. I think it's clause seven of, of the lease 
um, that provides for um, the, 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 where, where it says that um, if there's a change in the permitted use without the consent of the landlord, then and in, the, and in any of the said cases, it shall be lawful for the landlord at any time thereafter to re-enter the premises in the name of the whole and thereupon this demise shall de absolutely determine. So and effectively the lease will come to an end and 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 the thing is that basically the the um the St. Vincent's would then acquire effectively the asset uh, outright um of the state. And that's quite significant from just from a, a public interest perspective in terms of the uh, obviously the capital value that the state is um uh, going to put into this asset um is, is so significant. Um, so in general terms, what has to be said is that um like if in in legal terms you 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 have a lease where you want to retain control where the landlord wants to retain control and that is at the fundamental heart of this issue is that to 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 whatever extent it is apparent that St Vincent's are retaining control over the national maternity hospital um, and and effectively you know, the, the, there is questions to be asked, I suppose, and they are more, Simon has identified more in the political era, arena than maybe the legal arena, but, but they are questions as to why that is, um, uh, you know, something that the state would accept when one considers that this is, as Simon has identified, at least for 299 years, and, and, and as he rightly identified, circumstances, um, a change and society changes and will in inevitably change over that period. Um, and I suppose just in a high level, like the, the question is that w the, ch the state has choices and it has a choice and a valid choice as Stephen Dodd identified in his opinion that to exercise its rights, which it has in law to um, acquire compulsory uh, land for, for, for the National Maternity Hospital. And one has to consider that in a broad perspective that you know, um, when you look at uh, that this lease is for 299 years and decisions that may be made over the next number of days will determine uh, uh, this maternity hospital uh, for that length of time. Uh, when, and as I say, the state has the choice to exercise CPO powers and apparently is not willing to do so. Um, so it, 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 it's, it's kind of concerning in a way that a group of concerned citizens like, like everybody on this call tonight have to pour over, you know, the, the clauses that Simon has identified uh, over something so significant and has such ramifications for future generations. So that's all really, I suppose, in a high level, I want to say there may be further um, analysis, um, more in-depth analysis done uh, in, in the next you know, week or two on the documents. But from a legal perspective, I have to say that it is quite concerning considering the, the matters at stake. Thank you. Thanks, Owen. I think you've just reflected all the concerns of the people on the call tonight and, and echoed very nicely what, what Simon had said as well. I'm just looking at our time and we're, we're I know we started a little bit over and we're creeping up to the hour. Um, if anybody has any other um, questions, just either raise your hand or just unmute and, and jump in. I think we've covered most of sort of relevant to our discussion here in the chat. Um, I, I have a small addition while people yes. gather their thoughts on the question. Um, I do always like to be a bit constructive. Um, and so I, I will say that it seems to me there are, there are paths out of this, even in the constrained world where the, the deal as it is imagined within the, the documents, that there are paths to a better outcome. Mm. And those paths would be, uh, first of all, as I say, looking to see whether or not the new owners are willing to sell because they are not constrained in the way that the previous owners were. We know the reason why the previous owners didn't sell. They didn't want to, first of all, but they didn't want to because they were constrained by canon law under certain circumstances for disposing of the asset. But that is not the case in respect of the new owners. And so it's worth thinking to ourselves, well, let's start with asking, well, what about now? That's one issue. And the state has already said, the minister has already said that it would be preferable to buy it outright. And uh, I don't think there's a single party in the current government which hasn't said it would be preferable to buy it outright and to own it outright. 
That being the case, it seems like a sudden change in ownership and the counterparty is worth revisiting the question of buying it outright. Secondly, there's there's an argument made that you can't buy it outright because St. Vincent's Hospital Group has to own all all the things on the campus for the smooth running of two co-located hospitals. To which I would say, were that the case, how come St. James's Hospital does not own the new children's hospital that's being built co-located beside it? Uh, it, it is not necessary for the one uh, hospital group to own all the hospitals on the campus for them to work together in a seamless and uh, cooperative way. Uh, the other thing that I would say is that if we want to get out of this problem, if we want to move forward, and if it is the case that we cannot purchase it, then it's absolutely critical that everything that is lawfully permissible can be provided within this uh, within these hospitals, and that means that there needs to be certainty in respect of the uh, the permitted use of the building, and we should be able to say actually it's permitted for everything that is lawful, but if we must say that it was clinically appropriate for reasons that I have not had properly explained to me as to why that would be the case, but if we must say that, then we must define that so as to avoid 299 years of litigation. I think that's a fair summation, Simon, and I don't see anybody indicating to come in, so I'll just wrap up and say I agree with what you're saying. And what we didn't say at the outset, but I'll say it now, I will say that probably everybody on the call knows about the need and the urgent need for the new maternity hospital. Um, We're all in agreement on that, and we need to find the path forward. Peter? Yeah, sorry, just one final question. What, yeah. what, what exactly is the bottom line with ownership of the building? Does Will the state own it or will St. Vincent's own it? Because I'm, I'm not absolutely... You missed the goodies at the start, Dr. Boyle. Yeah, sorry, sorry. That's okay. Sorry. No, I I, 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 I've, I've shown us all the um, the first schedule of the lease. And the first schedule of the lease says that the both the buildings that are there now on the property and the buildings that are built in the future or amended or improved will all belong to the landlord, which is St. Vincent's Healthcare Group. Thank you. <laughs> very clear. <laughs> Imelda, I see you have a hand up. If you can ask something very quickly. Well, I actually, think. I just wanted to say there seem to be a lot of questions in the chat that I, I don't think were... Uh, I will I will now do something astonishing. I will answer every question in three minutes. Here we go. Fantastic. I'm, I'm scrolling. Here we go. Uh, what is the role of the Mulvey Agreement? Answered. Nature of unforeseen circumstances. Statement. It's simplest in terms. You can't see 300 years. Who are we to decide? We can't know. Hospital has an expected lifetime of 75 years. 300 years is misleading. It's a requirement that the state shall continue to provide a hospital over the course of the lease on the grounds. While you may want to uh, replace the building after 75 years, it does not mean that the hospital was ceased, just a new building would have to replace it. Uh, uh, 100%. The agreement applies to all future buildings. Yes, that's true. Um, statement, uh, clinically appropriate. Does Mulvey agreement define this deficiently? Uh, Mulvey agreement doesn't define clinically appropriate and where there is a disagreement between the Mulvey agreement and the legal documents, the legal documents take pre precedence. Terms would be four years if there are any terms at all. This would result in the um, St. Vincent's Healthcare Group taking possession and ownership of the hospital after four years. So I don't think that would be ideal either. A legally permissible service is available but not guaranteed. That's a, that's an interpretation. The interpretation of permitted use gives the landlord of the hospital a huge amount of discretion. We've dealt with that as to whether it's constitutional. Yes, because it's a question between the lease and the uh, tenant. Um, uh, we've answered that. Situations of triage prioritization exist. Decisions will have to be made on the ethos of the landlord. Statement. Um, mm, uh, uh, will there be private consultants using rooms of the hospital? Would this not immediately break the lease agreement triggering 850,000 per year rent? I don't know, but if the private consultants are providing services that are appropriate for a uh, maternity, neonatal, obstetric or gynecological uh, hospital, including in the community, as they say, in the permitted use clause, then I don't think that it would be in breach of that particular area. Have you any insight into indemnity? I don't. Maynooth University acquired land from the church approved by the Vatican. Why can't that happen here? I don't know. Uh, Sarah Murphy's question, Simon's response. Uh, the 1973 US Supreme Court was different to today. A future court could grant standing to a Spook or other group. We don't know what would happen in the circumstances where we have undefined terms to be 
decided later as to what they meant in the agreements. What about the role of offshore, offshore companies? I don't know. So that's fine. As per HSE document of consent, the Irish courts have not provided a definitive ruling on consent by children under 16 years. Does this constitute a legally problematic area? I don't think that falls within the area of discussion today. That might be a general question, but not one on, the, on this agreement. Who are the state to say that what's legally permissible in 300 years? Well, that's the problem of trying to predict that far ahead. Uh, is there a danger in not enumerating permitted use that a future minister of a more conservative bent might frustrate rights? Well, the minister's uh, actions would have to be a failure to, and it is on the minister's sole discretion that the golden shares powers are, are used, uh, but it would have to be the case that the minister chooses not to use them under those circumstances. This, of course, produces an enormous pressure to work out who it is going to be the minister for health, because this uh, power is solely uh, invested in them uh, in the future. There's a commitment to the dignity of person, personhood, that's fine. Human dignity is there, yes, it is. Um, Mr. Dodds, uh, things referenced. And we have, uh, Owen, would you agree we don't have all the documents that are required for full analysis? I'm going to preempt Owen from answering and say that we don't have all the documents as we have seen, that we don't even have the map saying how much of the internal properties are going to be reserved for the landlord. And uh, a couple of people saying nice things. And then where do we go from here? I think things have to improve and we have reached the end. That's quite phenomenal, Simon. Thank you so much. All right. Um, it was just one more that I added at the end. Um, what happens if a woman wants a procedure and is denied? Does she have to go to court and prove her request is clinically appropriate? It will depend upon the grounds on which the denial is is happens. And we will project this as being decades in the future. So it's not to recognize the bona fides of everybody currently alive and taking and, and working on this. But if in the future we have a, a disagreement, it would be whether or not the disagreement is based on the wording clinically appropriate, that that would turn as the basis on which the challenge would come. Thank oh, she, you. Oh, Sheena Connor, did you want to have a question? Yeah, thanks, yeah. Lorda. Just, I, I, I popped it into the chat there, but maybe maybe I can just kind of summarize it. Um, I mean, essentially, if, if the lease agreement is 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 absolutely perfect, um, that doesn't in and of itself prevent SVHG uh, from stopping a, a woman getting the healthcare that she needs or a person getting the healthcare that they need. Um, it would it would possibly need to be vindicated by the courts. So, is I mean, my question is sort of you know even if the lease is perfect, this means that, you know, potential in the worst case scenarios that we're trying to plan for, this means court battles, to, you know, for a woman to get her health care, or sorry, for a person to get their health care. Um, so is, is there any, is there any danger? Just I would that? say that there are two traditions at play here, and both have value, but unfortunately now is not the moment to mix them. There is the political tradition, which recognizes the value of constructive ambiguity, in order to allow for difficult positions and possibly not overlapping positions to be contained within a single agreement. And there is the legal tradition of absolute clarity, which is to say everybody sets out the, what the agreement is right at the start, so there is no ambiguity and everybody knows what to expect in the future. Those are two conflicting traditions. One is political and one is legal. And it seems to me that we have ended up with some ambiguity in a legal document where ambiguity is not constructive, but potentially destructive. Thank There's, you. Just, yeah, just, Peter. Uh, breaking news <laughs> uh, from Paul Cunningham of, of RTA News that the two former members of the HSE board, yeah. Deirdre Madden and Sarah Midlachlan, have restated their concerns over both the ownership as well as the governance control at the proposed National Maternity Office in Minnesota. More on RTE News at nine o'clock. Great. Well, thank you for that, Peter. And former, a, former members, they may have fine. resigned. Who I knows? was going to say that. And if we could hear what they have, to, if they're able to speak publicly on that, that would be very useful. It's possibly a good time to draw the meeting to a close. We can go and get a cup of tea and sit down and watch the RTE News and get more information on that. Simon, can I just thank you again and to Peter as well and to Owen Brady as well for speaking. We've had expert two different expert legal opinions, an expert obstetrician. And what's my take home message is that there's a, an awful lot of, of clarity and transparency that needs to be stamped up to this agreement before it is agreed. 
Um, the second thing I'd like to um, invite people is to contact your local TDs and, and just express your concerns to them. That was a question in the chat as to what we can do going forward. And I, I'd really sort of encourage people to do that. This is being recorded um, and it will be up on um, the JTG YouTube channel. So I know myself, I will have to go back and listen to it. There's been so much complex discussions of very complex documents. Um, it, it warrants another look. So thank you everybody for coming and, and your input and questions and interest. And thanks again to Simon and Peter and Owen. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.